Nicole Plato, the managing editor of Bloomberg City Lab, where we cover the future of cities. We're going to be talking on this panel about public health, which some of you may be thinking about lately. Of course, there's coronavirus, but that's not even the only or main public health crisis that cities are facing now, especially over the long term, and especially as climate change ushers in new kinds of natural disasters. I have a really wonderful panel with me today of women around the world leading cities to talk about their approaches to public health. Carmen Yulene Cruz Soto is the mayor of San Juan, Puerto Rico. Hazel Chu yeah. is the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Ireland. Thanks. Joy Belmonte is the mayor of Quezon City, which is the largest city in the Manila metropolitan area of the Philippines. Thank you all for joining me today. Mayor Cruz Soto, I'll start with you. As mentioned, it's hard to talk about public health this year without talking about COVID. How much of your time recently as mayor have you spent handling this particular health crisis? Uh, first of all, good morning to all of you. And it's very um, humbling to be in the company of, of this panel, especially around the world. Because one of the things that COVID has retaught us or taught some people or is trying to teach the people that still do not get it, is that we're all in this together. And that when it comes to health crises, really we're talking about global crises. Because even if it doesn't spread from one place to another, uh, we all can learn uh, from that. I, I started dealing with COVID on February of this year. And it took all my time, 100% of my time, for the first three months. Now it takes about 75% of my time. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, the way that we started approaching this in San Juan is something that I like to call cascade approach to crisis management. Uh, we know that when a crisis happens, it will cascade to other areas of the governmental unit. For example, COVID, I told the doctors, we, we are the only municipality small, as we are 320,000 people, the only municipality in all of Puerto Rico that has a municipal health system. So I told my doctors, yes, this is a health crisis. Yes, I will take, take decisions based on what you tell me and based on what the science is telling me. But as an administrator, I have to also look at all the other areas that are going to be touched by this. Um, so we began uh, by dealing with COVID testing and uh, what we call accompanying people, because it's not only contact tracing, is we literally accompany people with phone calls and health professionals that call them once or twice a day, depending on their condition. Um, then we moved into how do we ensure that the businesses that are closing know what programs are available? Then we move to ensuring that people fat food on the table because literally people were losing their jobs because of COVID. So we have to start putting together food to take to people's homes uh, on a weekly basis and set up that distribution system. And the other area is that uh, COVID hit Puerto Rico March 8th, which the first COVID case. And on March 16, the city had already launched a remote system to deal with all of the educational systems in San Juan. The municipality has three schools and a community college. Um, as we speak, we are rolling out our early Head Starts and Head Starts, which are for children uh, from three months old to four years old. Uh, remotely also, and that included doing a survey of people to know which parents were able to be staying home, uh, which parents would need the help of the elderly or their grandparents, because we knew from the beginning that older people were getting it, younger people were getting it and transmitting it, but not showing many symptoms, uh, fortunately enough, and making sure that they all had computers at home, and if they were three children at home, each one of them had a computer and making sure they had access to Wi-Fi. 
So as you can see, something that started as a health crisis, um, and we're the only municipality with a drive-through system. I know in the Philippines, they do a great job of testing their, their people. Uh, we are not nearly doing as much testing as we should be doing because of issues of um, having headbutts with the central government of Puerto Rico and with the CDC guidelines. The uh, CDC guidelines are also um, have to be implemented in Puerto Rico. So as a city, we implemented more from the beginning than the CDC told us to do. For example, there were only five countries that were on the CDC list. Interestingly enough, the U.S. wasn't uh, one of those countries when the spread of the virus was being seen. But we implemented a, a no physical symptoms, no questions asked. If you want to get tested, you can get tested. We do molecular testing. Uh, we're still looking for a very reliable, um, rapid test. Uh, that is approved in the U.S. that we can use. So we've also had to uh, enhance our capability of dealing with domestic violence issues because domestic violence issues have been rising, uh, as have been issues of violence against children because they, they are now cooped up in an environment with uh, their aggressors. So, so this is why I call it a cascade approach because it's a problem that begins in one level, but we know that it's going to, not slowly in this case, very quickly going to cascade into other uh, different levels. So almost every, um, every department at the municipality has had to have a group of people um, just focused on dealing with the COVID pandemic and preparing for how to deal with the aftermath of COVID. Thank you. You raised so many important intersecting issues that I want to get back to. First, uh, you gave a nice shout out to Mayor Belmonte in the Philippines and their approach to testing. Mayor Belmonte, can you tell us more about how your city and or your country has been doing testing? Oh, well, uh, I'd like to greet everyone first. Here in the Philippines, it is um, 9.30 in the evening. So uh, good day, everyone. And with regards to testing, um, unfortunately, we did not have testing at the beginning. So um, just like in Puerto Rico, we have the same problems. Uh, we had our first case in uh, Quezon City about the about the same time as you, uh, Mayor Cruz, uh, March 9th was the first case in Quezon City. Um, but like you, we have been preparing for this since January of this year because the first case in the Philippines came in January of this year. And um, we activated all of the necessary um, departments, got ourselves prepared. But in the beginning, it was really more about um, putting food on the table of our nearly 3 million to 4 million uh, citizens. You know? So uh, the beginning was challenging. It was a hard lockdown. Um, and um, it was two months of lockdown. And the primary challenge there was putting food on the table and giving cash aid to the vulnerable sectors. And that was really tough because we live in a very densely populated city. And just maintaining social distancing in a city like ours while giving cash aid and food aid was really difficult. You know? so, uh, we had to do house-to-house -house distribution of food, um, and that was really, really tough. And enforcing social distancing and minimum health standards in a city where people like to hug and kiss all the time was yes. also very, very tough. So the beginning was like that. It was really um, just about enforcing, just about keeping everyone home, and just about making sure that people were fed and understood what this crisis was all about. But later on, we did develop the other components of COVID response, which were basically uh, contact tracing. So now we do about 15 uh, is to one. So 15 contact trace individuals to one positive patient, which is fairly good. Although um, they say that the ideal would be 37 is to one. I think that's a little tough to achieve. Um, but um, now we do 15 and um, um, now we have our own laboratory and uh, we do um, our own uh, um, samples and we tested we've tested about 66,000 uh, of our citizens for PCR using PCR uh, testing and um, I think testing is really um, a big uh, 
solution to this problem, basically. Early, early um, well, contact tracing and then testing right away and then isolation. Um, and we do follow that uh, very rigidly. And now we're very, very happy because in the Philippines, or at least in my city, Quezon City, the positivity rate uh, reached about 20%. And now we're down to 8%. Our, our NOC okay. was way over one. I mean, it was really very, very disturbing and alarming. But now we're at 0.67, which is very close to, well, not that close, but the ideal of the World Health Organization is 0.5. And uh, we're looking forward to achieving that by December so that we can have a Merry Christmas. But basically, um, testing is, has, we do community-based testing. Um, we have a fairly large city, lots of people, but um, we do free testing um, as much as we can. Mm -hmm especially to the underprivileged sectors. And, um, and in the past, it was so challenging because you get the test results after a week. And that pretty much just sort of is useless. Um, but now we get them in a day or two. And that really helps in addressing uh, the spread of the disease. So um, yeah, I think we're on the road to recovery. And uh, with God's help and grace, um, hopefully, um, December will be a, a happy month for us here in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to hear that positive outlook for some of us in other places. Uh, you, you mentioned that you had started tackling this crisis much earlier in the year. Uh, Lord Mayor Chu, you actually took on your current role in the middle of the pandemic. What was that like? Did you campaign around COVID at all? Did you pledge to take a different approach than your predecessor? It was bizarre, to be honest. It, it's, it's been a very tough and challenging year for all, and um, the surrealness of uh, taking up office it, is, it hasn't quite uh, finished sinking in yet. My predecessor was uh, chairing a lot of crisis management uh, during this period, and what I, we had envisaged the role previously was that uh, the role in, in Dublin for Nord Mayor isn't directly elected. It's, um, it's elected among the council leadership um, of any given authority. So every any given local authority. So for me, it was elected among Dublin City Council. And it's funny because when I put myself forward for it, uh, a lot of people uh, were very supportive. And um, But we were also in a crisis that things had to change. So what was previously the role of being quite ceremonial for for the Lord Mayor became very policy driven and objective driven as well. So I found myself um, on top of that, I'm also chair of the of a party that's in coalition government at the moment. So I'm the chairperson of the Green Party, and the Greens and Fine Gael and also Fianna Fáil are what formed the government in Ireland. So during this period, while COVID started, um, I was also in negotiations for government um, at the table for negotiations. So for myself, it was a very bizarre process of um, trying to plan what a government, national government, would look like in these pandemic times. And then when I got elected as mayor, it was then planning on the local authority with the officials and executive of what the role and also what the city would look like. So uh, like the other two mayors, it was very much based on crisis management, it was a different. Uh, it, it was um, crises at different points, um, uh, um, and I, I think what happened was it was a lot of learning as you go for everyone in in the world, uh, and Dublin was no exception. What happened was we we literally got thrown in the deep end. I, I remember doing media on <laughs> in early March, uh, being told, "Oh, do you?" Will, will yourselves still have St. Patrick's Day? And half the panel on uh, saying, yeah, of course we will. And then the other half of the panel going, yeah, I don't know. We're kind of skeptical. And then within a week, we were in lockdown. And in lockdown, it was this, no one had experienced it before because it's never happened before in the country. Uh, but there was this great unity about it. Everyone understood that there was a common uh, enemy, which was the virus, and that it didn't... Uh, uh, discriminate between uh, race or co uh, or color or background. It managed to get everyone. So um, so there was a, a unity of purpose here, which was great. However, uh, then we moved out of it. So as as uh, our numbers 
got better, we moved into the road mapping of how the community, um, we, we road mapped it out of what stages we will be now in terms of fighting COVID. So by summer, we were at uh, level two, going on level one, and then we were now Unfortunately, we have a second wave at this point going. So we are at restrictions of level three now. And in some counties, we are restrictions of level four. And what we've learned through the whole year is that the public health system needs a massive investment. So we announced our budget, our national budget three days ago. And uh, with the national budget, it was very clear. The main uh, focus was investment in health. So it was 22 billion in health that we, we pledged to invest into. And, and it's a testament of what is needed around the country. And what is needed in Dublin City is, is better healthcare across the board, better mental health uh, system across the board as well. But it, it's, it's no different from any other country that I've been in contact with or any other mayors I've been in contact with, they all identify the same issues, which is physical health, lack of ICU beds, lack of a, a, a fit-for-purpose system, and then also the mental health strains and stresses that we now have to deal with. Because while fighting a second wave, you still have the um, issues that have come to fruition through the first wave, which is your mental health issues, your stress from elderly people. Like I've seen so many older people who were cocooning who looked like they've aged two decades in the short space of eight months. And when I got in contact with uh, some of the um, charities that predominantly help um, elderly uh, people, one of them alone, which is a brilliant charity, said to me, Hazel, we have key workers and workers going to people's house. Obviously, they can't go in. They have to stay outside, but you can, all of them report the same thing, which is our elderly population are really suffering. So, so on one hand, you have one spectrum, which is the younger population uh, suffering because they couldn't go to school, they couldn't go to crash at the time. And then you had the other spectrum uh, uh, of uh, people who were elderly people who are now still seeing the effects. And as we go into wave two, we're, we're seeing those effects even more. So right now we're on uh, what we call, I think, a second phase. I don't know how people actually called it the second wave yet, but we are on going into a uh, further lockdown situation. We're on restriction level three in Dublin uh, and in uh, other counties in Ireland. We are on level four on the border counties of Monaghan, Cavan and Donegal. So um, it's it will be... It, 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 it's not amazing. <laughs> so, it's far from amazing. But in fairness, though, our frontline workers have been incredible. So they they have got us through to where we are now. And from a government level, uh, from a local government and a national government, we are doing the best we can to make sure we get people through. Because like all things, and I know people find this very hard to believe, there will be light at the end of the tunnel. It may not be next week. It may not be next month. It, it will, however, be eventually. I, I, I have family that was in, in Hong Kong during SARS, and it's incomparable. But at the same time, to them at the time, they didn't see any light at the tun end of the tunnel. And what happened was they did come out. They Every country that had, um, had um, unfortunately had to go through SARS did come out the other end. And like I think now with the current COVID-19, like every pandemic and epidemic beforehand, we will come at the other end as well. Thank you. Nicola, yeah. Nicola if, if I may, I think uh, Mayor Chu brings up a very important issue that is not only mental health, but, uh, but the impact that this is having on everyday life and, and how from now on, how do we re-socialize people? How do we build a path for re-entry, as the astronauts call it? Yeah. Um, we're not going to have a vaccine until sometime next year, hopefully. So there will be children that would have been born in uh, 2019 that would have not been able to have a normal outside life until perhaps 2022. And we have to, as mayors, continue to tell people, wear your mask, keep social distancing, wash your hands. We've almost done such a good job in some areas of the world 
uh, more than others, that uh, we did such a great job of ensuring that, that we gave people the information that we had. But at the beginning, we didn't have much. So it was like, don't wear a mask, wear a mask, don't wear gloves, wear gloves, wash your hands, put gel, don't put too much gel because it, the, the virus will stay there. So, so um, one of the things that we have started doing, because we, we closed all the parks in San Juan, all of them are closed, um, is that we have started doing um, art related events on drive through or drive-in. Uh, for example, um, in, in our largest park in San Juan, we're doing photographic exhibits with music that people don't get out of the car, just drive through at a very slow pace. And they can drive through two or three times. They're listening to music and they are being able to leave their home we also did our first drive-through, uh, drive-in concert, uh, where everybody that worked in the concert part was tested through a rapid test, and then everyone stayed in their cars. And it was very interesting because people would say, "Mayor, what do we do? Do we do we clap? Do we honk? What, what do we do to ensure that the artist knows?" that that we're liking this so so i think what major Chu points out is is very important is is how do we deal with the mental health situation when when mayor belafonte was saying we have to go physically to people's homes uh, i'm sure that her experience is the same as as mine that's when you find out that in middle class neighborhoods where seemingly from the outside see things or buildings you think people are doing okay when you do that you realize that COVID has put forward a new level of poverty which is the working poor people that that have never depended on the government and all of a sudden they depend on the government for everything and they don't even know how to get help uh, in san juan we do just like uh, uh mayor um Vermont does and kids on we do no uh, testing we don't charge anyone for testing no so uh, on the drive through you can see a bmw uh, Mercedes Benz, and you can see a car yeah, can hear that you. the person has to open the door rather than and I'm gonna have to putting down the window because the window mm -hmm. doesn't roll down. And that also creates an opportunity for all of us, I think, as mayors, to start a conversation about how truly in crises, um, unfortunately, they're the great equalizers, and how do we capture some of that to make sure that our everyday life becomes better? Uh, as we as we head away from the COVID situation, which we will come out as as uh, I love it. I, I, I wrote it down, Mayor Chi, when you said no, 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 there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's funny how you say um, uh, the, the crises and, and and how the pandemic has emphasized a kind of a highlight of working poor, because I, I know I said at one point that the virus has no boundaries. It hits everyone, no matter where you're from. but in some ways it does hit the working class massively more because if you look at our frontline workers, the retailers, the ones who clean the hospitals, they're all on a lower standard rate and they're as likely to get the infection, but they also have a more likely increase to get the infection because they will be traveling by public transport. They will be working longer hours. They will be the ones that are in contact with the public even more than, than uh, anyone else in perhaps an office job. So they are, it does, so even though I said originally that it, it doesn't, it doesn't discriminate in a way, however, when you are, uh, you are working class or from a vulnerable background, you get hit more by it. So to Mary Cruz's point that it, it definitely has highlighted, the pandemic has highlighted huge inequalities because you, you like we, we see it in Ireland as well when uh, there was an outbreak in one of the counties um, 
next door. It wasn't because people weren't uh, wearing masks or social distancing here in the guidelines. The cluster came from a meat factory. So because the meat factory environment was that everyone was working so close together in these not great conditions and they were predominantly migrants or uh, working class people working in these factories and again the cluster saw from there so it emphasizes the point that there is a huge emphasis from this pandemic uh, um, on inequality and kind of the the the, um, uh, the wealth structure and class structure in societies and as mayors it's up to us to look at it and say say, say well how do we make sure for a future uh, fighting pandemic is one side but what makes it equal more equal and better society when you have these uh issues and pandemics coming along let's hope there won't be other pandemics but you know well you know what i mean so but you know i, I think mayor uh, belmonte uh, can relate a little bit more to what i'm going to say but when we had hurricanes irma and maria on 2017 it was also a cascade issue we uh, the the true disaster didn't come from the hurricanes as much as from the botch effort in this case of, of the federal government uh, and subsequently of the local state government in Puerto Rico. But but then again, those that had money got on a plane and left. Those that were not uh, getting paid by the hour got on a plane and left or closed it up in their homes and they had generators and they had um, um, water water um, filtrating systems. But those that had to drink from rivers started getting, and I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it right in English, leptops, leptospirosis. Leptospirosis. Yes. Uh, so, so in every crisis, it seems that that these inequalities that may be hidden behind in puerto rico it was plain and simple we lost 30 million trees in those two hurricanes so beautiful landscapes that would hide low income uh working class communities all of a sudden were were complicit no more and, and we were forced to see the the people that we have left behind as a society so so as as, as hard as these you know sika chikungunya um uh, hurricanes uh, uh, now the pandemic um you know it, it almost seems like the mayors of the world uh, and, and i want to thank uh, uh, Bloomberg uh, City Lab for doing this because it almost seems like the mayors of the world we have to continue this talk about how do we take the lessons that we learned from crises management and we embed them into our everyday life so that things structurally change. So when the next hurricane or the next pandemic uh, reaches us, which I hope it's not in my time for heaven's sake, um, that, that there's a book somewhere that I don't know about you two, I'm sure it, it's the same. Those are my dogs, Marcus. <laughs> but there's that there's that there's a, a guideline or a, a map or a route almost done okay this is the first thing that you do when a hurricane hits re-establish communications do this do that which are things that now we know and wish we didn't have to know but how do we how do we get that level of understanding to to other mayors to new mayors to cities that are smaller and may not have had the experience uh, that 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 we've had as a shared community of mayors dealing with these issues. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mayor Crusoto. And I, I agree, hopefully this conversation can be the beginning of that. Uh, Mayor Belmonte, uh, both of your, your colleagues here have mentioned this idea that I think you mentioned as well about, of course, COVID having elevated all of these policy issues as being intrinsically related to public health. Um, and potentially as this crisis as an opportunity to rethink surrounding policies on housing, food insecurity, et cetera. Can you point to any particular ways that you have been able to rethink policies around some of those issues during the crisis, maybe even for the future, if not something you're able to implement immediately? 
Well, actually, Nicole, to be honest, um, this crisis has really changed uh, everything for us here in our city in the sense that uh, when I was first elected, that was last year, you come up with a beautiful plan, uh, development plan for the city, a beautiful budget, you have all these wonderful dreams, and then, you know, something like this strikes and, you know, everything just falls apart in the sense that this is something that you're unprepared for, but you have to deal with. So we've had to change all the policies of our city now, um, change the plans. I had to realign the budget five times just to be able to uh, produce enough resources to be able to, to deal with this pandemic. And from a, a plan that was re that revolved around something else completely, um, I've now had to do a recovery plan. So uh, when you asked earlier, Mayor Cruz, about how, how much time she spans on COVID, I would say, Mayor, it's probably 100% because um, a lot of the things we're doing now are things that are direct consequences of the COVID pandemic. So uh, the policies that you make with regards to incentives for businesses, for example, um, have changed mm -hmm. with regards to um, the priorities that your city has. Uh, in the past, it was something else. Now it's totally food security uh, because we realize yes. how difficult it is to feed a community, a city of about 3 million. And then we had about another million stranded workers who work in our city but come from somewhere else. We, and we have to support them. So food security has become very important. Mobility. Uh, we realize public transport is such a, a big cost for transmission. And now we're trying to promote um, active transport, uh, building bike lanes, uh, fixing our sidewalks so that pedestrianization is promoted, uh, uh, promoting other kinds of transport uh, not, that is not related to congested uh, trains and buses, right? So um, it's totally different. And the way you do, uh, um, let's say, retail is different. How you acquire your, the things you need at home is different. So um, now there's so much more investment in online um, services in training and retooling our workers to adapt to a system that they were not accustomed to in the past and to adapt to a work environment so different from what they're used to. So now they have to work from home. Now they have to get used to technology. Um, now they have to um, do transact business online. And then government has had to adapt very quickly to these needs as well. Now, so um, long and short of it is, is everything has changed because of this pandemic. And, um, and now, um, I think that in relation as well to what the two other mayors, Mayor Chu and Mayor Cruz mentioned, the whole well-being of people has become such a big priority because before mm -hmm. it, it was physical health, but now mental health is such a big issue. That's true. Discrimination of healthcare workers and COVID positive patients is a big issue here in the Philippines where people, for example, who have acquired COVID, I was one of those actually, I had COVID. Um, they're not allowed to go back to the apartments they used to live in, even if they were already declared well. Healthcare workers are not allowed to go back to their subdivisions or homes um, after working in, in hospitals for long shifts. I mean, this is a big issue in, in, in the country um, that we have had to deal with. And I've had to, um, um, I've had to work with the private sector because we were not that well equipped to deal with mental health issues in the Philippines. And there are a lot of private organizations um, more, more better equipped and we've had to um, partner with them to address this, uh, this problem. Mayor Cruz mentioned domestic violence. This is also a big thing here in the Philippines. A lot of women have become victims of violence, children as well, of abuse. I think 20% increase in um, violence against women and their children occurred during the pandemic. And one response I've had to do is to build a shelter where we can take away these victims and bring them somewhere safe, a safe space for them. So this is another public health issue that was not very big in the agenda before. And now I think the number one, um, I, would, I would say would be malnutrition. And before the pandemic, we were we had very little malnourished children, wasted children, stunted children. Um, albeit there were some, but um, not this much. And now it's it's become num the number one health issue of the of the day: uh, feeding our children, uh, making sure that they get enough nutritious food. Um, and then we had a lot of uh, pregnant women as well who were stressed because of the situation when they gave birth, they could not breastfeed their children. So we've had to support them, and we've had. Um, Luckily, we have a milk bank, and um, we were able to, to supply some uh, milk, uh, human milk, to our stressed mothers. No, so these are a lot, of, a lot of health issues we did not anticipate and did not prioritize in the past are now at the center of our agenda of governance. And um, 
to, to answer your question, Nicole, everything has changed because of this pandemic. And uh, I think the important thing is to be resilient and to realize that um, part of being a good leader, I guess, is to be able to anticipate everything and to be able to, um, to um, adjust very quickly to the demands of, of the times and the conditions. Yeah. And just to go back to something as well earlier that you mentioned earlier related to mental health, sort of. You and and uh, Mayor Cruz as well had mentioned cultural issues, especially around hugging and kissing and changing people's behavior. So in addition to all of these other surrounding issues, there's actually messaging around the virus and getting people to change their behavior. What have you found to be effective in terms of persuasion strategies or public education strategies to address those cultural questions? You want to go first, Mayor? Okay, well, for, we are the same. We have a, a Spanish background, right, um, Mayor Cruz? And so we do love to kiss and hug and, and beso beso, you know. And um, it was really very difficult um, to be able to communicate to our people that you are not allowed to do these things uh, right now, you know. And um, I think that was a very big challenge um, to be able to do that. But, but I think that uh, being able to communicate very clearly to the people that in using various channels, using social media, using traditional media, using uh, celebrities, actors, etc. Um, that really helps a lot. And of course, you know, um, along with communicating, you have to have some policies for enforcement. And here in this, in, in our city, we've mm -hmm. had to pass a lot of ordinances, like mask wearing was not an issue here because we just right away pass an ordinance, you must wear a mask. Otherwise you will be fined a tremendous amount of money. And um, people in the Philippines generally, you know, they, they follow uh, the rules when they're there. Um, we passed um, all kinds of ordinances pertaining to social distancing, mass gathering, um, breaking protocols or quarantine um, a lot of that, you know, and so one challenge actually we've had to deal with is actually how to not draw, cross the line between protecting the people um, and making sure that they remain healthy and um, violating human rights. I think that is a very big issue in a country like ours, especially in a city like ours, where we have had to enforce rules that in a sense, uh, are in the middle of that of that line, you know. And I don't know if Mayor Cruz has that same experience, but yes. I, I, as a mayor, got criticized a lot by civil society because of in the beginning it was so difficult to navigate what was correct, what was allowable, what was a, a violation, what was actually protecting people. Um, that um, there was a lot of criticism in the beginning, and 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 one of the challenges was really getting through that and transcending that and overcoming that. And um, now, sort of, we've gotten kind kind of used to the situation now, and people tend to just uh, do things voluntarily. Oh, they voluntarily wear a mask. They voluntarily practice social distancing. Then we even have face shields in the Philippines. We overdo it actually in the in the Philippines. We have acetate. We have a face shield, and we have a mask. And people are very happy to do that. Uh, to protect themselves and their family. So it's been a learning experience, but, but I think people have adjusted um, as of now. I, I think in our, in our case, much yeah. as what the mayor has said, but also modeling. Mm. Um, the fact that I wear not only one mask, but two masks. Um, I wear an, an N95 and then I wear a cloth mask on top of it. Um, which I often use to, to message something. Uh, T-shirts, I was mentioning uh, to Nicole before, I have a T-shirt that has a mask and says, use it. Uh -huh. um, but, but also, it, it was very important at the beginning to say, look, what you're doing is saving the life of those that you love. And maybe you don't know the person next to you. So you may not care about their life as you care about your children, but they have children. So you have, if you want somebody to care for your children, you have to care for their children. Um, with us, the dancing was a big issue. Um, you know, in order for people to dance, they have to touch. And, and um, it, it was a, a very, very painful road of highlighting difficult situations. And, and we saw many of them. I saw a few, uh, of uh, one or two of Ireland, many of the Philippines, many in the United States. Uh, 
and we highlighted them here of no matter where they were from especially frontline workers coming home and their children wanting to hug them and them saying no you can't hug me right now but also that first month of ensuring that we were given the information i stood up in a podium and the first thing that i did in front of the entire media was i took my alcohol and sprayed everything cleaned everything uh and at the beginning there were lots of memes made out of that a, a lot of um oh she's being ridiculous but but as as we started understanding that if you clean the surfaces, if you wash your hands with soap and water and so on, people started learning. But I also, and I'm sure Mayor Chu had the same thing, um, we all, almost seem to be the recipient of, of all of the pent up feelings that people have uh, because we become the, the example of the person that's telling thou shall not. So, so um, we did such a great job the first two months that people didn't want to come back to work because they were scared. We literally scared them to death and, and people didn't want to come back to work. Um, we, because, because we have this, this uh, experimental side to our hospital in our city, um, we started with joining protocols of of not testing but of ways to treat people so we did the first um plasma donation into a, a sick patient um in puerto rico so so we also showed people we're not only handling this from the standpoint of what is going on but we are looking at ways on how to deal with it going forward uh, that, that is the example of what uh, Mayor Belafonte is saying about um, food security. Because when your city gets shut down and no one comes in and no one leaves, it almost becomes one of these medieval scenes from a Game of Thrones episode of um, how much food and water do they have inside those walls to keep them before they have to come out and, and we can get them. Um, so, so also we, I'm Frank, we used children a lot. We, we, we pinpointed a lot of um, attention through children because if children are wearing a mask, they will pester their parents to wear, but that's the only reason, I, and I'm embarrassed to say, if my daughter saw me with this bottle of water now, she would be freaking out. But that's the only reason why I recycle, because my daughter started recycling and she nagged and nagged and nagged mm -hmm. until I say, OK, I'm done. I'm going to start recycling just so that you shut up. So we use children. And now mm -hmm. uh, in our early head start, in the head start um, we we are doing whole uh, educational materials on children on how to wash their hands and how to keep safe and social distances, which frankly helps you with other diseases as well. Um, but but we, we, I keep telling people the day will come when we can hug and kiss again. And, and I'm sure that day will be a day around the world where people will go out of their homes and just hug everybody. Uh, uh, just like when World War II finished, uh, where people would come out and hug everybody. Uh, but it's, it's been difficult because it's, it's always a help. We've had to suppress who we are. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love the idea of using children. Uh, Mayor Chu, I, I want to briefly talk about climate change a bit more. You, As you mentioned, you have a leadership role in the Green Party. Uh, there's been some interesting potential opportunities in terms of people walking and biking more in some places during the pandemic, but there's also been several allusions to the challenges with public transportation for essential workers. Um, some folks are scared to take it, other folks are, uh, other transit systems are, are struggling, 
and a potential increase in adoption of car use. Uh, can you talk about, those are the challenges, can you talk about whether you see opportunities here as well to advance climate change agendas in this moment, and it, particularly in your own city? There's a massive uh, opportunity. I, I think we see it in our city, uh, first and foremost in Dublin, it was great to see that with all the various crisis management teams, there was one called the COVID mobility team that we had uh, and the staff are amazing on it. I, I are, happen to be in a lot of those meetings where we plan what the city would look like in terms of mobility during COVID. So the accessibility uh, part that Mayor Belmonte had mentioned in terms of social distancing and pedestrian uh having more sustainable transport through cycleways because at the end of the day if you look at the Dutch system there are a, a majority of their transport is by bike so and it does work so it works around other cities there is the fear like we I, I spoke to the head of our transport authority here and her point was, well, when you have government saying that you should avoid um, uh, public transport, people avoid public transport then, and you mm -hmm. have a drop in uh, the usage, and you have then the increase in ch uh, cars. You see it in China, I think, uh, with some of the lockdown cities, the car uh, sales went up three times. And this is what you're trying to combat. You're, you're, you're trying to make sure that people understand Yes, you need to be safe, but there are other sustainable ways to be safe that uh, may not uh, uh, put you on a, say, crowded bus and train. And that the crowded bus and train scenario as well doesn't happen as much when things are managed. So with our local, with our um, transport authority, what we have worked out is there will be staggered times, there will be um, a more fleet, uh, more um, service to make sure that each bus only has a certain amount of people, to make sure each tram has a certain amount of people. Uh, as I said, we've had been rolling out segregated cycle lanes across the city and also widening uh, pedestrian assets as well. And but but it, it takes a mindset. It takes a, like a real shift in mindset to um, Mayor um, Crusoe's point about a uh, younger generation. It's absolutely right. When uh, she got nagged uh, about recycling, that's what she did. Uh, and it's the same here in Dublin as well. When you had thousands of young people last year march on the streets for climate change, the politicians started noticing, and you will see it in a direct effect to the policy. Like in the Greens themselves, they saw a surge in the party and as such uh, enter government, and you can see it with the government policies. I We just um, um, published a, um, a, climate, a, a climate bill there last week, or um, the starts of a start of a climate bill where we want to see a climate law that's set into every set department um, of government and part of that aspiration is to reduce the uh, emissions by zero to zero actually by 2050 which is a huge target to to set because previous governments had only set it that would reduce it by a certain percentage where we're very blunt and said well you need to get it to zero that's that's your time frame uh and i think there is a will i think this is the thing back to your point about has there been a is there an opportunity i think true covid it's a horrific tragedy and challenge but there are a lot of opportunities within these challenges as well you see it across every country that people are planning their cities differently they're thinking of how to make uh, their cities a, more socially just a more socially equal um and to um Mayor Belmonte's point about malnutrition and looking at that, seeing that happens means that they're now able to tackle it. Just like us in terms of seeing the fact that we know climate action needs to be had, it needs to be implemented now during the, the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic and through the pandemic as well. And I think people, I think there's always an argument that says, oh, well, we're through pandemic, so we can't do it. We, we need to push it to some other point. But the, the climate crisis is as big as prior crisis as everything else that's happening at the moment. And right now we need to prioritize pandemic, we need to prioritize climate change, and we need to make sure things are fit for purpose when we move out the other end. It's all about kind of the road mapping. For me, it's about road mapping of what, where will we be in six months, nine months, and a, two years time. Um, how 
what will we do now in terms of, uh, in terms of climate action that will directly affect us then in a year's time? Because by a year's time, if we do it then, it will be added lateness. Like we're already too late in many ways. And I, it's, it's not any of us here that have to worry about it. It's, it's my daughter who happens to be three of whether she'll have a planet to in, inherit or not. So it's uh, um, Mayor Cruz Soto's daughter who is fighting about, uh, to, re to mm -hmm. push people to recycle, um, to push mm -hmm. people to, to think more greener. When you have a younger generation that's literally marching to the streets, then you have to pay attention because at the end of the day, those are the generations that take over in future. There are successors it'd be it, for the planet and for politics and policies. And if we don't set the policies right, they're the ones who suffer from it. Absolutely. Well, well, Nicole, Nicole, one thing that, that Mayor mm -hmm. Belmont mentioned about food security, and now Mayor Chu mentions about climate, it, I, I think through mm -hmm. all this, um, policies and, and public management is turning from being reactive to understanding that one has to be proactive and plan. Uh, the planning departments, uh, or the think tanks within our organizations are no longer a luxury, they're a necessity. Because we, we are all looking for permanent solutions to recurring problems. We're no longer willing to put band-aids on issues because we know that they're more expensive and they create a lesser problem. So when Mayor Chu is speaking about, some people think we're in the middle of the pandemic, we cannot deal with climate change. There's one very prominent uh, person like that somewhere living, you know, in a white house. Um, Does he tweet a lot, Mayor Cruz Soto? And yes, tweet, he tweets tweet a lot of a lies lot. And, and just pure yes. disinformation. Let, let's not he get started on that one. So. He tweet, he will have another hour on, on that. Yeah, we can but, have another but hour. It, but, it's, it, but it's important because what that tells us is that all levels of government have to be aligned if one level of government is singing one tune uh misleading by a bad example and we at the local governments then that makes our job a lot more difficult so that philosophical alignment or at least that common understanding and common ground between the central government and the municipal government is something that is quite important. And what we're seeing now is mayors leading the way for, for some of those very important and needed. Look at how Mayor Chu said it. We have climate change is a priority, the pandemic is a priority, you know, mobility is a priority. Absolutely. It is an issue, it is an issue of how do you juggle those priorities but they're all priorities. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to wrap it up there, but that's a perfect point to wrap it on. Thank you all so much. I'll be thinking about the children. Think tanks, if you're watching, we need long-term plans. Uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.